Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church of Hopkins, Michigan. To those of you who are here and those of you who uh, are out there wherever you are. Today is the second Sunday of End Times, also known as Last Judgment Sunday. That gives you a little bit of an idea of what we are going to be focusing on in our lessons this morning. The theme, as the bulletin says at the beginning, God will judge the world justly. So let us worship on this last Judgment Sunday. We'll be using service of the word. You can turn to page 38 and following. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have the privilege to be able to come into the presence of our God and to worship Him who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, we need to confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Let's do that together. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. The message of the gospel, the good news is this, that God our Heavenly Father has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Savior Jesus Christ, He has removed your sin and its guilt from you forever. The result is that you are a perfect, blood-washed child of God. May God now give to each of us the strength to live according to His will. Amen. Possessing both the peace and the power that forgiveness grants to us, let's praise the Lord. presents a dramatic courtroom scene which portrays the eternal majestic God, awesome in power and appearance, taking the judge's seat. As I said in catechism this week, we actually hear a, a new name, another name of the Lord God, the Heavenly Father, that you and I don't normally use. 
And uh, he's called the Ancient of Days. Makes him sound old, doesn't it? Well, there's a reason for that. The Ancient of Days takes the courtroom's seat as the judge. He opens the books of evidence and then does his faithful judging. We turn our attention to those two verses. By the way, these are the, the two verses that form the basis for our, our sermon meditation this morning. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Here ends our first lesson. Our worship continues with the psalm of the day. It happens to be Psalm 90, a psalm of Moses. You'll find that on page 99 of your hymnal. Let's keep the psalm together. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. You turn mortals back to dust. You sweep them away in the sleep of death. The length of our days is 70 years, or 80, if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The word of our Lord continues from our second lesson, this time from the epistle, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, the first one. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. The day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. It's going to come very unexpectedly, uh, suddenly. This calls for watchfulness and self-control. The breastplate of faith and love. Helmet of salvation on our part. Turn our attention to the second lesson. Now concerning the times... And the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security. Then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman. And they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Here ends our second lesson. Watch 
Therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Hallelujah.
Lord is coming. And his chariots are like a whirlwind. He will bring down his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For with fire and with his sword, the Lord will execute judgment upon all men. And many will be those who are slain by the Lord. Those are words of the prophet Isaiah, last chapter. Normally a section of gospel, but it is gospel truth of what that says in Isaiah 66, verse 15. The word of our God this morning that is also gospel, gospel truth in that way, is from the Old Testament lesson, our meditation source, Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10. We hear this time from the NIV versus the, the ESV that we heard in the, from the lecture. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and his wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from <coughs> before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were open thus far. In the name of the Lord, the Lord, whom you and I know to be a compassionate, gracious God, slow to anger, abounding love and faithless, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punished the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and the fourth generations. In the name of a gracious, but a, yet a holy and just God, dear fellow believers. I'm sure if you are like most people, you have wondered what judgment day is going to be like. That's one of the things that we take care of in catechism class. In catechism class, we run through the schedule of events that are going to take place on Judgment Day. The last day of the world when Jesus is going to come back in all of his glory with all the angels to judge, as you and I say, the living and the dead. Thanks to especially the, the gospel reading, Matthew 25, places in scripture like that. You and I know the schedule of events pretty good. You and I know the itinerary of judgment day fairly well. Combine Matthew 25 with other places in scripture, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Peter, etc., revelation of Jesus Christ, you and I have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen on that last and final day, the day in which Jesus is going to come back for the last judgment. One of those verses in Scripture that does give us a little bit more information than some of the other verses in Scripture is, is the two verses before us this morning. In fact, the vision of Daniel will give us some more information about the last and final judgment. And isn't that appropriate? Isn't that fitting? A little bit more information about the last judgment on last judgment Sunday. I thought that that was pretty appropriate. So as we, you and I view this vision of the prophet Daniel, I would ask you to take comfort in the in the words that Daniel gives to us from this vision, the information that is passed on to us, because, because this judgment day information is really for your and my consolation. Unlike today, where the Lord uses his scriptures, the Bible, 
to communicate to you and me what he wants you and me to be believing and knowing. Back in the Old Testament, he sometimes used visions and dreams to tell his people what he wanted them to know and to believe and to do. Such was the case with a vision that was given to the prophet Daniel during the Babylonian exile. In fact, we have this vision of Daniel's in chapter 7. If you're not familiar with the vision itself, you can open up to chapter 7 and, and see that Daniel's vision was about four animals, four beasts, that uh, one was a lion, one was a, not a tiger, but a bear, and we had a leopard, and then the fourth one was an unnamed beast. Daniel's vision of four beasts was similar to the dream that he interpreted for King Nebuchadnezzar uh, in Babylon back in chapter 2, where Nebuchadnezzar's dream also had four of something, but not four animals or four beasts like Daniel had in his vision. Nebuchadnezzar's dream actually had a statue made out of four different kinds of metal. Both Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's vision portrayed the same interpretation. Both were talking about the coming of four world empires. And from hindsight, you and I know them to be the empires of Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, Alexander and Greece, and of course, the Roman Empire. One thing is for sure, with both of these, both of these places in Scripture, Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's vision of chapter 7, the Lord provided some very valuable information for his people of the near future as well as of the distant future. And one thing is also sure is that uh, um, some of the stuff that people of God weren't going to like because when these governments and their rulers came into being, they did not treat their people, much less God's people, uh, humanely and very kindly. In fact, they more were characterized by the beasts that they were that Daniel visualized, whether uh, it would be a, a lion, a bear, or a leopard, or the unnamed beast. Um, and so uh, people would be uh, treated not so well, persecuted because they were believers. But one thing is for sure, Daniel added a conclusion that would be of, of great encouragement and good news to people who suffered from these kingdoms and their rulers and their persecution and their treatment. The question that many of the people then uh, suffering from the inhumane treatment and cruel cruel treatment of these governments and their rulers would have is this, would the dark forces of evil who would gain control of the world and various future empires and their governments and rulers frustrate even undo God's will for his people? The answer, folks, is really the crowning comfort that you and I can take home this morning from Daniel's message. Yes, from the very conclusion to Daniel's vision. When it looked like everything was out of control because the forces of evil were in control of everything. That's when Daniel went from the four beasts and what they would do to the conclusion of his vision. The conclusion was good news and encouragement for God's people because it went to the last day of the world. This is a day when the beasts of the earth, no matter who they were, the rulers and their kingdoms would not have the final word. It would be the day called the last judgment. This is when the Lord would have the final say and the word. And this is what these two verses are comprised of. The last part of Daniel's vision shows us the day of last judgment. 
here we are not only given a symbolic glimpse of the one who judges, but also what he is going to do. First of all, in verse 9, we are given a glimpse of what this judge of all judges actually looks like. But before we get into verse 9 and give, these, give this vision to you, I want to give you some words of warning, FYI, so to speak. The vision that Daniel gives to you and me of the Lord here, of the ancient of days, is not the way he really looks. Okay? He's a spirit, remember? He doesn't have a body. So why in the world is the Lord giving Daniel a vision of, of the vision that he gives here when that's not the way he looks? Well, he's trying to present some points of truth that that Lord willing, the Spirit will give to you and to me as he gave to Daniel and his people of uh, what the Lord wants us to, to hear and to understand and to figure out from this symbolic language. Yes, we're talking about prophetic symbolic language, eschatology, uh, talking about the last times and the last days. And just like gen, uh, Revelation of Jesus Christ, you and I don't go and assign little, little tidbits of truth to every little detail in these prophecies. To do that, you and I would miss the forest for the trees and miss the main point that the Lord wants to get across to us in prophetical figurative language. One point of, of, of interpretation that you and I need to always remember not just that scripture in terms of scripture, and, and, and don't let anything else uh, sway you from that, but you and I also need to know that you and I take every single word of scripture, literally, every single word of scripture, literally, 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 what it says is what it means. Okay, don't, I know that there is figurative language, and prophetical language is often figurative. We hear the as is and the likes. The kingdom of God is like. Or think of this as. Yeah, that that is when you and I take that word or that message literally, it's telling us to take it figuratively because it's using figurative flags saying, hey, guess what? To take this literally means you got to take it figuratively. I say this because everybody has got it backwards. Everybody takes the revelation of Jesus Christ literally when literally means to take it figuratively. You and I, when it comes to principles of hermeneutics and interpretation, you and I take every word of the Lord in Scripture literally. And when it tells us to take it figuratively, that's still taking it literally. So FYI before I get into this. This is, the, this is what the appearance of the Ancient of Days uh, is told us about here. Verse 9. It says, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and his wheels were all ablaze. I'm sure that you thought about it. I know other people have. What do you think the Lord looks like? I know some people have said, well, he looks like a white-haired old grandpa, right? Who just is smiling. Uh, probably like a politician, right? Wants to just say the right thing to everybody and just uh, make everybody just happy, just by smiling, white-haired, accepts everything, doesn't say a bad word. For some, to some point, you and I do have reason to think of him as a white-haired old grandpa because that's actually the picture that is given us here of the Ancient of Days, the Lord, the Heavenly Father, right? He's not only called old with the name Ancient of Days, but, but he's actually, uh, he's actually is uh, given the impression that he is old. Again, his clothing is as white as snow, his hair and his head was like, well, I, I was thinking about that. He's like a Mr. Clean with hair, right? Just white everything. What, what is the reason why the Lord is pictured as, as an old, old gentleman, given the name of Ancient of Days, an old name even? Well, it's portraying him as somebody who is, what is a person who's gray-haired? Wise. 
lot of times it's wise, right? Wise. Great hair comes with wisdom. And this is showing him as a wise and a venerable ruler, right? Shows that he's been, a, been around the block a while or two and nobody is going to take him for a fool. He cannot be mocked. Actually, the whole idea is that he is portraying himself as with the character of being eternal. Not transitory like the governors and the governments that have been here and gone that Daniel described with the four beasts and that, that King um, Nebuchadnezzar described with his statues made out of different kinds of metal. They are here and gone. But the Lord, the Ancient of Days, still is here. Yes, his character of being eternal is shown here with this this ancient of days and being portrayed as an elderly gentleman. His character of being eternal. What a comfort that gives to the people who are members of his kingdom by faith. That he's not here today and gone tomorrow like other rulers and kingdoms. And then comes the thrones. If you notice, I'm going to go backpedal here a little bit. Notice, as I looked, Thrones, plural, and not one throne, although we are going to talk about one throne, the Heavenly Father's throne, but there are throne, other thrones here, right? Whose thrones are those? Probably what makes sense is you got a throne for the Father, you got a throne for the Son, you got a throne for the Holy Spirit. That would make sense. Although, Scripture tells us in Revelation chapter 12 that, it is, that there are two thrones, one for God and one for His Lamb, the Lamb of God. So two thrones. Take that uh, from Scripture. But here we're talking about the Heavenly Father's throne. Obviously, it is a throne that is on fire. It's flaming, isn't it? With And it's set on wheels with flaming fire. What is it trying to picture? It's trying to picture a war chariot, right? That is, that is, that is originally the first Hot Wheels, right? But this is a war chariot in which the Ancient of Days is speeding along, executing his judgment upon uh, the battlefield of Armageddon. And again, we heard that in Isaiah 66, the way we started out this morning. A war chariot with flaming wheels, and that actually a river of fire coming from before him. We talk a lot about fire, don't we? Fire? Fire has a lot to do with the Lord. In fact, in the Old Testament, how many times did the Lord appear to mankind in his visible theophanies using fire in some way, shape, or form. The pillar of fire by night, the burning bush in Moses. Several times he did that, didn't he? Fire, a lot of times, has a, has a double significance. Sometimes it talks about its destructive qualities. Yes, fire destroys, doesn't it? Fire burns things up. Fire does portray God's law and his holy wrath and ire against sin and all unrighteousness and his holy ability to destroy uh, all that and his enemies. Fire is the ultimate fate of those who defy him and do not believe in his son. The other meaning of fire, the, the other significance, it's not a destructive, but it is a beneficial thing, isn't it? When we're talking about believers, what does fire do? It purifies them. Sometimes the Lord puts believers into the fire of affliction. Why? Not to destroy them, but to make them better, to make them stronger, to drive them to his means of grace where their faith can be strengthened, made better and stronger. So fire does have a double significance here. Fire of judgment, fire of strengthening, fire of purification. The appearance of the ancient of days certainly has to do with fire, and it was certainly done for the purpose of encouraging his people who were would be so discouraged from being citizens of these four beastly governments and their rulers and their kingdoms. What a breath of fresh air to see that uh, the conclusion, uh, the way it's going to end up, is that the ancient of days and portrayed like he is, is going to finally uh, take care of business once and for all with, without, without favoritism and without corruption in his judgment. 
That's where the vision of Daniel goes on from describing the appearance of the judge to what the judge is going to do. Here comes the judge in verse, in verse 10. It says, Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Certainly a gathering of all gatherings, right? If you ever thought you would like to count how many angels, try counting the stars in heaven and you're going to find out that you're, you're not going to be able to even, even accomplish that. Just think of all the angels and the messenger beings and the spirit beings that are in this gathering and that's what you've got here in this vision of Daniel, all these angels, spirit beings. And then the court, actually it's the word for judge here. The judge takes his seat on the throne of judgment. And then we are told what he will do. The court was seated and the books were opened. Verse 10. Even the courtroom of justice in the Lord's heavenly realm needs evidence, written records of what people have done and what people have not done. And so books are required for evidence in the Lord's courtroom. Books? What kind of books are we talking about? Or what books are we talking about? The books that were open, we know of one as being the book of life. We heard that in the, uh, the readings from the lectern, right? The book of life. In that book, all those who belong to the Lord, their names are printed in that book. And if your name is not in it, your name has been blotted out from that book, that means you are lost. If you are, your name is in that book, that means that you are saved. What's the other book? Probably uh, you think the book of death. No, not really. It's the other book. It's called the one from Revelation 20. It's the book of records. It is a register of, of every person's deeds, what they have done and what they haven't done, so that the Lord can do what he said in Matthew 25. After, he, after they have been judged to be a goat or a sheep, sheep put on the right and judged to be a goat on the left, and how are they judged? They're judged as unbelievers or believers. Then he's going to have a public commendation as well as a public um, shaming of, of the unbelievers. A public commendation of believers. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servants. I saw you do this. It was evidence of a living faith inside of you. Um, come and inherit the kingdom. To the, believe, to the unbelievers, the goats on his left, he's going to say, you didn't do this. There, you didn't have faith to be able to do this. I recognize that. So uh, depart from me, you cursed and everlasting fire, prepare for the devils and, and his angels. So we hear what's going to happen when the book books are open on Judgment Day. The rest is easily understood, isn't it? What's going to happen on Judgment Day is that the Lord is, is going to meet out His last judgment, His final say to those who are His unbelievers, and He's going to reward His believers for um, the faith in His Son and what their deeds are. Um, what their deeds have done because of that faith. When you think about Judgment Day, I think it is a subject that really is a scary topic for, for anybody and everybody, especially if you know what is at stake on Judgment Day. When you and I know that that's the day that the Lord is going to have the final say and that He's going to meet out all of His, his wrath and His hatred and His anger and His vehemence against against sin and sinners, and that there's going to be no mercy. The time for mercy is done. It's over with. He's going to exact his justice and his vengeance. Vengeance is going to be his on that particular day. That would, that would be enough to scare anybody and give them nightmares in their dreams. And even though for most Judgment Day, because it's unknown really what's going to happen, there's a fear there. But even if you do know what happens, you really have to fear. And it's a scary day. For you and for me as believers, it's a day that you and I get to look forward to, isn't it? The, the day of last judgment is a day when you and I are going to be publicly indicted as a member of the special holy family of the Lord. That's the day when you and I are going to be publicly commended for our faith and what our faith did 
for our Lord here. Our works don't get us forgiveness of sins and eternal life. It's faith in Jesus that has been given to us by the Holy Spirit that makes us a sheep and a righteous one and motivates, enables, and empowers us to be able to do what the Lord wants us to do. This is the day when, when this veil of tears, you and I can say sayonara to it. This is the day when sin and all of its consequences, you and I can say goodbye. This is the day when you and I can, can say vaya con Dios to every enemy who has persecuted us or even think about persecuting those who are the Lord's in this world. It's a day when every bad thing, persecution, suffering will come to a complete end. Isn't that a day that you and I should be looking forward to? And it is, isn't it? It's a day when you and I finally get to cross from this veil of tears into a paradise where you and I get to sit. And it doesn't matter where and what place you and I are going to sit at the seat of this, this banquet table. You and I are going to be able to sit in the banquet table, the wedding feast of heaven. And just to be there is going to be a glorious thing that you and I are going to be able to soak in all the days of eternity, forever, and all thanks to Jesus. That's why you and I really look forward to it with joy and anticipation and eagerness when the Ancient of Days will take his seat on the throne, that flaming throne of judgment. Yes, we're going to be judged, but we're not going to be found wanting because Jesus has done everything for us that needs to be done. His living took care of what we need to do in the righteous department. He did that for you and for me. Don't ever forget that. And everything unrighteous that we've done, and I know you guys pretty good, You've done some unrighteous things. And I've done more. I know myself even better. I've done worse. All those are going to be gone. Thanks to Jesus. That's a day that you and I look forward to it. Isn't it? Gotta be. But until then, this is not heaven and earth, folks. Until, until then, you and I need to remember and realize that we are in the church militant while time goes on. We are in a church that is under the cross. Sacrifices have to be made. And you and I, who are members of the church, have to make them. And we do, don't we? Even if it's a cross. Sacrifice. But though we are under the cross as being members of the church militant, it is the message of the cross of Christ that motivates, enables, and enables, and empowers every single one of us to be able to carry that cross, to make those sacrifices, to live and endure, even though it might be terrible and tragic and, and all sorts of bad words can be applied to this life, and it might become worse when the governments that, that are ruling us in our nation, in our society, in our community, are more like the beasts that were described by Daniel, like that of a, a lion, a bear, a leopard, a tiger, whatever. Life is not going to be hunky-dory here, but the, the message of Christ and his blessings of what you and I have will motivate and enable and empower us to endure and to survive and to win. So as you and I wait for the last judgment, let us all eagerly anticipate, motivated and enabled by the, and empowered by the cross of Christ and his message, eagerly anticipate the coming glorious kingdom that will be ours, but not until the day of last judgment. Let's arise and confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. You'll find that on page 41. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. We continue to pray the prayer of the church. We pray. Withhold the punishment the world has earned, O righteous judge. Stay the hand that would destroy the evil of our day. Remember the little colony of heaven on this earth we call the Christian church. These are the latter days. They are shamed by every kind of cruelty that the wicked mind and evil lust of humanity can conceive. Inhumanity and terror are commonplace. Dishonesty and corruption abound. Violence and outrage are on every side. The forces of Christian good are decimated by the defection of so many who indulge their appetites at the tables of wickedness. Yet for the sake of the remnant who honor you with pious lives, extend your time of grace to work your holy will upon this earth. When you come again, you will destroy forever the power of the wicked foe and will bring ruin to his willing servants. The times are short. Give to each of us the boldness to witness to all before night comes and work is done. Break our attachment to this world. Point each of us to the skies. Prepare us for your coming. Help us to live the life begun in us so that your coming becomes the stepping stone to our fulfillment. Let victims of crime and stress and disease find comfort in the knowledge that what befalls on earth will pass and that heaven is our home, really. For those still without hope, our prayer is that the Spirit call them now, enlighten them today, and sanctify them with us to your eternity. O righteous Lord, ancient of days, Savior of the world, remember the world with mercy. Yours is the word by which many may yet to be saved. Speak, Lord, and let your servants hear. For the day is coming where mercy will be done with. We pray these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Lord and ruler of the nations, you are in complete control, aren't you? You tell us not to trust in mortal princes, but to place our absolute faith and trust in you. By your most holy and powerful word, strengthen our resolve today to do that more and more. Help us to be mindful as your children of your desire that we pay proper respect and honor to our nation's newly elected officials because they draw their authority and office from you. Guide them with your eternal wisdom and use them for your holy purposes. Lord God, you are the ruler of all. You are in control of all things. We commend our nation and its leaders into your care. Bless our president, the members of Congress, and all officials who serve us in the state, county, and local governments. Impress on all of us who are in a, impress on all who are in authority the sacredness of the responsibility you have placed on them. Give them the gifts required for leadership, wisdom to make the laws that will bring order and justice to our society, and compassion for the downtrodden and the poor. Purge our land from dishonesty and corruption in government. Teach us to honor all civil authorities as your representatives. Through stable government, provide throughout our land an atmosphere in which your church can do its work in peace. We pray for our government officials today, on this day, in Jesus' name, who has also given us these words to use as well in our prayers to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. I thank you, my Heavenly Father. Through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. Keep me this day also from sin and every evil, 
that all my doings in life may please you. And to your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters in Christ, go in peace, live in harmony with each other, serve your Lord with joy and gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace.